MVP data. And so I started recording now, Dennis, because uh, video recording, folks, and uh, the quarterback, that's my dog, and MVP, the RBs and MVP. And again, if you want to know what that is, Dennis has developed this new methodology of looking, consistency, values, uh, best, average, worst, uh, trying to make a great gumbo here. And it's been pretty tasty. Dennis won some money last year. So he's yes, he's enjoying the uh, spiciness of his MVP data. And I'm trying to help him do that. So uh, today we're going to, and I promised we would look at the wide receiver. So if you're watching this video or listening on the podcast, you can eventually, I'm going to put all this probably mid-March and you can see all this, but uh, let me and, share. And really quick, while you're, while you're yeah. getting the data up for it's everybody, coming up. Yep. I'll explain the MVP analysis for yeah, the go newcomers. Ahead. It's, a, it's a very simple concept, okay? There's three things every week that a player can do. He can either really help your team win all by himself by having a huge point game. He can bury your team by having a crappy game and putting up the donut for one point and causing you to lose no matter what the rest of your roster does because you just get beat up in that one matchup. Or he can keep you in the game by having an a, just a slightly above average performance. And the study of the data going back, as I have over many years, it has shown to me, Professor, that you can have a team of all just slightly above average players, and you're going to win a higher percentage of your matchups every week than having those huge hit or miss guys that are all over the place. So it's just simple. Look at the consistency percentage of hitting that that median, that historic figure based on the professor's research over many, many years. Look at a plus 10 from that, so a big game, and then look at a lousy game percentage, subtract for that, and you get the MVP. 100 is elite, 75 is a good solid, like WR2, RB2 starter. 25 or better is like, hey, this is a guy that won't kill me on a flex play and anything less than that. And there are guys below zero. Those are the guys you don't even want on your team, let alone on your bench. So looking at the wide receiver yeah. over the last six years. And here's your data, Dennis. It's shared. You can look at it and comment. It's a year position MVP average, the high, the low. So, and then mm -hmm. you're uh, who's above 100, 75, 50, 25, and you're uh, greater than 10 games. You might talk about any of those you want to talk about real quick. Correct. So, to make this chart you have had to play in 10 or more full games okay the idea is i don't want to give a player any credit mm -hmm. if they only played six or five or three or one game mm -hmm. during the season a full game at wide receiver is defined as somebody who took 50 percent or more mm -hmm. of the offensive snaps or scored over 10 points so a player who's just a little shade under maybe he's only playing 40 percent of the snaps but he scored 10 points he gets credit for that as a full game that week you could see on this data that while the average mvp is down 11 from the six-year median mm -hmm. the number of players over 100 over 75 and mm -hmm. over 50 have been fairly constant over time. They're, they're really close. They're one or two mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. most years. It's within, if you look at the, at a typical year, mm -hmm. 
the number of guys over 75 or over 100 has mm-hmm. been pretty close over the last several seasons. Now, the interesting thing here is the number of three wide receiver sets is increasing mm-hmm. in the NFL. And that's shown by the fact that there were up to 76 guys now that played 10 or more full games last year. That tells me that these multi wide receiver sets, these more than two wide receiver sets are being used more often in the NFL. So, so do you think at the average, the 44% is there something going on there? In other words, is it going to be surprising to you if we ever see something above 60 now? Even though yes. 2020, 2018, you know, w- even 2019 was close, 57. But the last two years, something has really changed. 51 yeah, and I think- and 44 really knocked it out. And But look at your full games that you're telling us. That seems to work here. That That's what hits me when I look at this data. Yeah, we're seeing an increase in 12 guys from Mm -hmm. the basic population the basic population was 64 which makes sense there's 32 teams Mm -hmm. two wide receivers per team Uh so it makes sense that that number would be around 64 Mm -hmm. just you know right around the number of 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 right that's what you see starters Mm -hmm. you'd have but what we saw last year was this population search to 76. 76. But the number of elite, the number of over 75, the number of over 50 in MVP didn't change. didn't change. So what we're seeing is we're seeing an increase in lower scoring MVP. We're even seeing a, an increase, if you look at the data even more closely, we're seeing an increase in guys that are below zero. So well, the seeing, floor was pretty low last year, minus 70. Good to Yeah. Know. Minus 70 to a plus 163. That is a that's a big huge, range. That's a huge range. range. Yeah. Huge range. But what intrigues me, Professor, mm-hmm. the population over 100 within one of the six year, the 25 category within a half. That tells me. The starting populations at wide receiver are not changing. Mm-hmm. You the, the guys you want on your team as your WR1, mm-hmm. the, the population of WR2s is not increasing. But we're seeing more and more guys like an MVS or an Alec Pierce who are really good blockers. Mm-hmm. They're really good at taking up space but they're not really good at scoring fantasy football points, but they are getting the full games in because there's other doing the snaps. Yeah, correct. There's other things that they do very well in the game of football, other than catching the football. And it seems funny to say that at wide receiver, but we're seeing more guys that are, are good because they're a, they're a big body that takes up space or they're, or they're just good at what they do of playing football, contributing to their team without the football uh, in their hands. And that is something that we don't want on our fantasy football teams. No, no we, we don't. Uh, do you know what happened in 2018? Look at the above 100. Yes. Yes. And, and, a- and, and look at, yeah, something really was going on there. Yeah, there was a huge spike of really, really great players, and yeah. I'm I'm wondering if we if we look at that in more detail. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder if the Is that touch- cohort gone now. Yeah, I wonder if the touchdowns, the number of touchdowns scored that season by wide funky. receivers yeah. was up. It, or that, you that might- wonder the last year it was back to eleven. You wonder has that cohort at 2018. Are they gone? Are a lot of them yes. retired or yes. injured? And you wonder. You wonder. And I am looking at that in more detail to right. see what happened to this population. But this first set of data was mm-hmm. just kind of a way of looking at okay, 
have, has the population changed? Because what we have seen in recent years are mm-hmm. more wide receivers being drafted in the first and second rounds. Mm-hmm. But my data suggests that that population of guys you want on your team, the, the WR1 population, the WR2 population, they haven't increased. They've stayed pretty close to the median that we've seen over the last six years. But the way we're drafting has changed, which is really quite interesting to me. And so I I went and looked at your MVP average last uh, 18 to 23, and then the average of the total PPR points, and then the max, the best of the, you know, the last six years. And so we had one of the best. I mean, 294 wasn't too bad. I mean, the highest was two, eight, you know, two, 219, uh, 21. They were, you know, 300 something. But uh, 2018 was one of the worst years for the best. There was a, if there were a lot of players, they were all clustered. Probably, I, I wondered about the clustering. Now that I I heard you talk, you, I wish I had. I, I need some some interns, Dennis, because I got <laughs> questions. I would love to see the distribution right off that max for 2018, just for my curiosity. And where was there like a bunch really close, like say 200, 210, 222, 30? Versus some of these other years, like the highest was 219. Was it just one or two unicorns? And then the rest of the population was closer to 250 or so? You know what I'm saying? You could imagine the distribution. We just had some really extremes, you know, because when you just look at the best. And then the average, things like that can get muddled in as well. But the last two years... According to this, it 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 looks it's uh the average total PPR points was some of the highest. And I graph that. And if we look at the trend lines, uh we've had the last two years were the highest. If you look at the purple line, Dennis, and I, I tricked you. I went from newest to la- to oldest. See, I uh, usually the, the, the <laughs> Yeah, I flipped the axis on you there. And then the MVP is some of the, you know, the green, uh, the green bars. And then the total, the max was shown in blue. So the last couple of years, we've had some of the lowest max, but uh, we've had some of the highest average of wide receiver uh, PPR uh, numbers. And your MVP, some of the lowest. So there's a lot of, uh, interactions there. So I think what that tells me is you're tracking more than if people just, and again, we've seen this with QBs and RBs. If you're just looking at total points, folks, I think you're missing these subtle things and you're probably going to be tricked and be- bamboozled at the, you know, in your draft. Dennis, I, I really believe that in this kind of data. In other words, if total points was the end all be all, then your MVP probably would would fall, would follow that. And it doesn't. Yes. So you're measuring something else, consistency. And I think total points doesn't touch consistency as much. The the input of that is not as higher, right? If you kind of measured the percentage of consistency. And I'm just guessing, because I haven't done the principal component analysis of this, but I would predict that consistency is being missed by total points and maybe even points per game may be better, but not, I think your MVP is hitting that. And it's a weekly game. You see, that's the thing. If we were playing maybe best ball or total point leagues, then maybe MVP is not as good for us. I don't know. I haven't tested, you know, to where it puts money in your pocket with total point leagues versus head-to-head leagues, right? 
we have done MVP and I've done my comm data to try to get a handle on that weekly advantage. And so that's going to be maybe different, probably is going to be different. I think I could say that with total points, Dennis. Yeah, and here's one interesting thing that I've just picked up on the data and looking at this in a different way in this graphical form. Yep. Because while the population of those WR1s has not changed much, there's there's still the same number of players, mm -hmm. that, that percentage advantage that you would have by having two of those on your team, weekly. on your team, weekly, weekly. that advantage has increased. So you would that's, spank your league mates. Yes, because the, the replacement level guy will be a lot lower. That's what this lowering average of MVP shows us. So while the population hasn't changed, I guess there's a good reason we've been taking wide receivers earlier because that advantage over the rest of that population that you'd have <laughs> is increasing. So that is another little bonus mm -hmm. that looking at MVP is, has kind of informed us. And so this next data, Dennis, is what I, I like to do. The, I like to look, folks, and I believe this is – I guess this is something that I believe gives me an advantage. I look at data, but I'll look at it different scales, different levels, kind of a top bottom. And here I looked at the highest and I assigned that as 100%. So any number off your MVP is a percentile of the top. So last year, you, we were at the 68th percentile. So 2018 was 92, 88, 185, dropping. We've never seen in the 70s. 2022, 78, last year, 68. Wow. So when I show you those other numbers, it's, yeah. but when you do it this way, it, it shows you, damn, that's 32% that's down from the top. The median, the last two, I mean, the scaled average uh, uh, PPR uh, ATPs, um, the average total PPR, that's what that says, ATPPR for wide receivers was 100%. The best was last year. The scale was, uh, the max was 93% of top. So, Almost inverse again, Dennis, just like we saw with the running backs, an inverse thing happening. Total points, if you're believing that, this was a great year. Everybody had a great year. MVP, not so fast. 68%. Big difference. It's th This is two pieces of information telling you two different stories. And if you're only looking at total points, you're get. I think you're getting the wrong story. I really do. And I plotted this, Dennis. Again, the purple is the average uh, total ATP. You can see the last couple of years really high. The green was your MVP. And again, last year was the lowest. It's a little bit more smoother when you do the 100%, you yes. know, it smooths it out. It's not as crazy, but still, I think you're being tricked. I mean, one would think, wow, this has been the best, you know, years ever. And, uh, I th but, but your MVP, see, I'm, I'm curious in 2018 and we should, we didn't another figure here. It's called money in our pocket. And if we plotted, <laughs> if we plotted that, I mean, that to me, and I, I mean, we probably should do profit or something, Dennis. I haven't, in my diary, I should, you know, I just kind of show how much I make. I don't, I, I don't remember what I made in 2018. But wouldn't that, we, we need to start doing that for the next few years to see if we plotted that, does any of these variations change? In other words, having high points, does that put money in our pocket? What about 2018? It was the lowest in this scale. 
did we lose that year or did we still win? That kind of thing. I, I would love to see that as a figure there. Yeah, it's it's very interesting when you talk about return on investment. I think my you, return on investment. So I'm saying if you plotted that, what would you yeah, see? Yeah. Yeah, it, it can be kind of skewed because I play a lot of dynasty and I But I'm added, saying if you only did yeah. where you paid attention in a weekly yes. MVP strictly used it. I mean, even if you don't, you probably should keep track of that anyway. Yeah, and and my ROI was huge in 20 and 21 because I started more leagues in 20 and 21. <laughs> and I'm really good at first year dynasty. Uh like I I come out of the box rolling because I intentionally come out of the box rolling. It doesn't mean my team is lousy in years two and three. Mm -hmm. It just means that I'm back to competing. Whereas I, I usually blow people away in that first year, first two years of a league I'm, I'm dominating. And then as time goes on, the guys that kicked the can down the road by trading for more draft picks and more draft picks and more draft picks, if they finally let the players play for them, they'll catch up to me. My final four percentages stay pretty calm. Like I stay in the percentages are really good in years three through five uh, of ownership of a team finishing in the final four. It's just those first couple of years, I usually win more of my leagues in 20 and 21. I happened to decide that I was going to increase my play quite a bit. And so I won more money those two years uh, as far as that goes. But tracking my redraft in best ball last year was the first year that I've really utilized an MVP style idea at mm -hmm. drafting. Before that, I was heavy into my weekly values, which are still valuable, are still being factored into the mix. But it's hard to sometimes know what caused that increase in ROI. Yeah. So I like to look at how is my batting percentage getting to the final four. And if that stays pretty good, the yeah. ROI will be fine. The ROI will not be as smooth as your percentage of making it in to the final four in your leagues. Okay. okay. Last piece of data. Uh, this is from last week. This is the RBs. And let me yeah. say folks, listen, I did an independent study and it's, uh, I think I published it last year. You can look at 2023 data season, whatever you can, it's, it's, it's embedded in there. Uh, and I looked at Dennis's MVP compared to the public's uh, uh, total uh, uh, PPR points. Which one's better, worse, as far as predictive? In other words, I took last the year before's data. How did it stack up to this year's at the end of the season? In other words, could we have used the top, you know, weekly values, folks? How did they persist to the next year? and so forth. So I went through in pairs compared, you know, last year and this year and PPR. And what I found was his, his quarterback and RBs were tight and were better than the public. You were beating the public. The WRs and the tight ends were the same. But, but my argument, even for those, Anytime you're doing something different and getting the same as what the public's doing, you've got an advantage because you're doing something different. And you go, you know, if you get deep in the data, you're going to disagree. And if you're right and they're wrong, then you win that debate, as it were. So getting back, this is so remember, Dennis's weekly values, his RB data was superior to the public. And this is. The data I showed you last year, just the variation from the last six years. Look at the public in orange, Dennis, real skewed. So again, unless people are really good and staying above the water here, 
you were kicking their butt if you look at the blue box. Look how tight your MVP was for running backs versus the publics. Wow, is that tight or what? And you and my predictive analysis data for you was this confirms that. This is not a surprise to me. So you were as good as the public in WRs. This is what Dennis has been waiting for. Here you go, Dennis. Ooh. Your WRs are not as tight as the RBs, but they're still better than the public. I like so, the fact that my box is above the median. Yes, it is. Of of so of, I still the, think you're probably beating the public. But but from what I did year to year, I, I showed it was the same. Very interesting. That's that's it makes sense to me that if my concepts of looking at a weekly value for running backs and quarterbacks are better or mm -hmm. far better. It, yes. it makes sense because wide receiver. It's a lot you more think, variation here, Dennis. A lot more variation. And it makes sense because the average RB1 is getting just shy of 18 touches a game. Yes. Obviously, a quarterback's got the ball in his hand the whole game. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. The R, the wide You're receivers. You're good at the. Yeah, I'm going to be paying. Hey, just, just to cut to the chase, folks. I'm going to be listening when. Uh, what is it? E. F. Hutton talks. People <laughs> listen. The old, you know, Grandpa commercial back in the day of the stockbroker. There was a stockbroker, E. F. Hutton. And the commercial. Uh, had when he, you know, they were telling, and E.F. Hutton says, and the whole room gets dead silent. When Dennis says, that's how the room should be on his QB and RB. But anyway, it, I, it, I, it, it makes sense. I'm building more... your ego up. <laughs> you need to tell your wife she needs to chew on your ass a little bit to knock it back down. <laughs> She'll so be you glad need to, to get yourself that. balanced. Yeah, I'm sure she will. She'll, she'll be need, glad to take care of that. Yeah, you need, you need to get chewed a little bit <laughs> to balance yes. your ego. I'm giving you too too good an ego here this Friday. Well, it, it makes perfect sense to me, Professor, because the average WR1, just shy of seven touches a game. Big difference. Versus 18 for a running back. So yep. that's a lot more variability. And if you if you look at how they get to that average, it's it really is skewed because some of the WR ones on teams will get as few as one or two touches on some games and 15 touches on the other games versus the RB ones might vary between 10 and 25. So they're getting still at least they're getting on at the lowest end. They're getting more touches than the well, average. The, 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 yeah. The receiver. bottom whisker for the public is at 40%. If we look yeah. at the RB, the bottom whisker is 120. It's uh, closer to 45, almost 50. So it's higher. The bottom whisker is higher with RBs by the public than you. And, and the looking at the looking at my MVP against the public, this is performing much better than the weekly values did last year. Looks my very week, interesting. Yeah, my weekly values were closer to the spread mm -hmm. was closer to what the public was on total points. Yeah, this may be better. I haven't tested the predictability of your MVP. Remember, folks, I only did yes. this weekly value metric. Well, we will be able to do some of that because I do have the data back now six I, years. So I we look can, forward to that. We can. I'll get that data over to you so you can uh, you can grind those numbers. But what we're seeing at it with MVP. Mm -hmm is interesting because if we look at a two-year cycle mm -hmm. on MVP data, that seems to be pretty, fairly predictive of the future. So I am i haven't 
completed the analysis yet on that, but I'm mm -hmm. I'm okay. very intrigued by it. But this result has me very excited, Professor, because any time that the spread of my box here mm -hmm. in the box and whiskers is better than the public. half, like it's better. Like I'm I'm less variability than the public. That's very very good. I expected the whiskers to spread out at wide receiver versus running back. That makes total sense. And I think the variability at tight end might be even larger. Yeah, I'm not going to show you that, Dennis. You're but trying, if to, we could, you're but trying if I, to tease that out. That would be next week. But I've if got I could, all this. But yeah. if I could still beat the total points, I'll be feeling well, pretty good about well, that. So, right, but We'll this, find out. This is an encouraging, encouraging sign because I – from the top to my bottom, mm -hmm. I'm I'm only a 35% run versus yep. 60 yep. for yep. total points. That's tight yep. data and, indeed. And, and I think, Dennis, this should tell the public people that total points, the variation is a lot more, and your data is getting you tighter with QBs and RBs. So again, that, and you can't treat them the same, right? So if somebody looked at just total points and just behaved the same with every position, just whatever it is, whoever the top guys are, that's my guys. We're going to, look, you're going to cross paths, but there's going to be exceptions to that. And Dennis is going to catch those. And you're not, folks. You're going to be like, how come the top guy didn't do it again this year? And, you know, you're sucker punched and you don't even know where it came from. I think that's the advantage that Dennis is is waving to us is we're going to be able to kind of, you know, parse that out a little bit and, and at least maybe give us a warning or it's like, mm, I'm a little worried here. That, you know, uh, the lower MVP – should kind of almost tell you, hey, I need to look extra, extra hard. At the, think about it. When you're drafting, your homework is not just pulling up that sheet, you know, 12 beers in to go draft, okay? You know, if there's money on the line, if it's fun, then, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, have your dog pick. But uh, <laughs> let his Paul hit the, hit the keyboard for you. But if you're putting money on, Folks, I, you don't want to be surprised. Why would you draft somebody that there's something going on that's like suspicious? Why? I mean, why would you? It's like, well, I wonder. There's the the there's something in this hole here. Let me stick my hand in there and find out what it is. Well, if it's a rattlesnake down here in Arkansas, you get bit, right? It could be a you know a rat or something. You won't get bit too bad, but you get venom here if you get a timber rattler or something. So, yeah, you just don't stick your hand in there and feel around, see what you come up with. Louisiana, you do that. You're liable to get a neutral rat. You lose a <laughs> or snapping turtle, and you lose a finger. I mean, you go down and look at some of those hunters and fishermen. They don't have all their digits, Dennis. <laughs> They're gone. They was the turtle. The turtle got the gumbo. Sometimes you get the gumbo from the turtle. Sometimes the turtle gets you for its gumbo. And, you know, you lose a finger down there. But you don't stick your hand up there and say, well, what is it? But that's how people draft sometimes, Dennis. Well, let me just stick, let me just grab this guy, you know. Don't do it, folks. And here's what the joy of this strategy with MVP, how it is materializing. Because this is how I used this concept last year before I even put a number on it. But based on my consistency data and guys that didn't have a lot of bad games, um, you know, they might not have that many great games, but they didn't have any bad games. They kept you in the match. And what I did was I had a certain point in the consistency. If it dropped below 40%, mm -hmm. I didn't want that guy on my team, Right. period. I would rather draft a player in a new situation or a rookie with better upside potential 
Mm -hmm. then take a very, very average or below average, actually, a much farther below average player who's established himself. And one of the pieces of research that I'm doing, Professor, mm -hmm. we will know what the maximum increase in MVP has been from and the maximum decrease has been for a player. What's the biggest jump and the biggest drop that somebody has had over the last six years? I'm doing that research. So we will know when we're drafting players where the floor is. If this player, and I don't know what the number is, but mm -hmm. let's say that the study says under 35 on MVP, it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. The the percentage chance of that player mm -hmm. being worse mm -hmm. for your team on any given week, it, the numbers will say where that number is based on What's the chance of him increasing to a 50% or more player? Right. You will know that data. So we can go into our drafts next season in the 2024 season, mm -hmm. knowing that once we get to a population below this at running back or wide receiver or tight end, I'm taking the rookie. I'm taking the second year guy who isn't established yet. I'm taking next year's Kyron Williams. I'm taking next year's Nico Collins. I'm taking guys that are in vastly different situations because those are the guys that have shown in my study, they have the most volatility. They didn't get volume. Now they're getting volume. Can you 100% predict that? No. You can't. But what if last season when I was drafting running or wide receivers and I got to that point in the draft and all I did was take Nico Collins, Noah Brown, or Tank Dell when it came my turn? What if I took Puka Nakua when it came to my turn? Instead of drafting a below average player, go for the upside guy. And we will know what that number is. Based on the last six years of research, I will know we can, we can throw everybody out. Under this population, throw everybody out. Will one player beat us? Yes. But we want to play the odds. And our odds will be in our favor to have multiple upside potential guys from that point in the draft on. And we'll hit some, we'll miss some. But if we take the below average player, we're going to get a below average result. Wouldn't you much rather have the risk reward of having a hit rather than knowing you're going to get a miss? Because if you take an established player who has established his low yep. score potential, all the best, his ceiling is going to be worse than some of these guys' floors when they get more opportunities. And we'll know that. We'll know who the risky players are to go for and which are the certainties to avoid. And that's the intriguing thing that i didn't think we'd see in this data but the research is saying we'll have some magic numbers and let me add i think you should look at mvp change as they change teams yes because this new ceiling cap maybe we get more shuffling of the chairs so yes. i would love to ask the question rbs wrs QBs, tight ends, changes, you know, get me positions. I've done some data on this about four years ago, and I found that WR1s team tended to fall between teams, tended to do okay, but RBs tend to be a lot, had a lot more variation. So I, 
I have, you know, again, I was only measuring kind of total or PPR points per game. So that probably, as you can see, probably wasn't the most efficient way what to measure. So with your MVP as tight as it can be, I think I'd like to see that data as well. So that I'm, I'm uh, saying I would love to see that study as well before we hit the draft. So we could then make be predictive about some of these changes. Because I think Barkley's leaving, Henry, oh, probably yeah. Jacobs. So it would be nice for the RBs. What happens, you know, historically? Does your if they've been above 75 or above 100, does that stay? I know they're they're getting older, and that's a confounding factor. Probably for RBs, WRs may be a little resistant to that. So you probably do need to catch the age, Dennis, kind of keep track of that as well. You know, I would love to see your age versus MVP. You know, what where's that drop off? That's what I would love to see in your six-year data. And, I mean, starting, I know we don't have enough to do that, but I would love to track that as well. So I, I'm kind of giving you some homework assignments. I mean, I'm trying to be sweet. I'm, you know, Professor, <laughs> telling you what to do. But I think that's some homework that I think this MVP metric, I think you could bring home to us. And like I said, we, we'll, you and I will decide if we need to tell folks or not. Sometimes it's fun to keep the secrets to ourselves and make them more money. Or if you ever get around to, setting up your patron account, make people pay, Dennis. Come on. I mean, I see them on the internet, uh, uh, Twitter paying for some of these uh, loudmouths, some of their, you know, shock data, you know. Well, <laughs> this, I mean, if they're going to pay for that stuff, and I, I question whether they get anything for their return, why not get some stuff that's like, at least there's some science behind it and a methodology and a testing so, you know, I'm just saying maybe the science of fantasy football down the road. And just I will hint this. Dennis and I have talked. If we can ever turn this into the daily fantasy platform one day, maybe that's where we, uh, you know, apply our, our tr tricks, our scientific tricks to that. Maybe that's where we start charging folks here because the – the degenerate gamblers out there will, you know, they'll be salivating <laughs> to pay us big money here. And, and we need to, a lifestyle we need to become accustomed to Dennis, you know, having our suites in Vegas and our top, our top hat and cane walking in with our Ferraris and, you know, our theme music and our, you know, handlers, you know, walking out into the casino. Yeah, we're here. We're bad. Be you and, uh, you know, Wilder and, and Pryor, Richard Pryor. <laughs> yeah, we bad, we bad. I think I can, I can mimic that. Oh, yeah. I yeah, see we... you as the Richard Pryor, though. Yeah. You just got that, you've got that, you know, you've got that walk, Dennis. I know you do. Oh, you yeah. Could, you could channel your inner Richard Pryor. <laughs> well, it's in my what DNA. A, what a, you know that's a great movie. Come on. It, Ancestry DNA says that I, I, I can channel that part of me without a doubt. That's good. But yeah, that's the research has only begun, folks, on MVP mm -hmm. data. It was very successful last year, but the strategy decisions are what really intrigued me, Professor, because mm -hmm. we know for a fact because last year we hit home runs on this mm -hmm. left and right. Mm -hmm. I know that if a player is below a certain percentage, but listed as the, as the starter, that guy's going by the wayside eventually. And I have an idea where those numbers are. And it's it, the bar set pretty high these guys and if they cannot maintain that level while playing a full slate and i'm only asking them to do 10 games out of 17 i'm not asking for a lot mm -hmm. but if they can't hit a 10 full games 
above a 75 on my MVP index. I don't want him on my team. Like, okay. it, it, I might take a guy who's 73, but I'm not going to take guys at 53. Gotcha. Because I know that the chance of improvement is just not there. And I want to go with the upside potential, folks. I, I will, last year, I was all over some value plays. I was all over Kyron Williams before you had to pay free agent money for him. It wasn't because I thought that he was a great player. It's because my metrics told me Cam Akers wasn't. So my answer in those situations is to take two of them from that team mm -hmm. that aren't the guy who everybody else has taken. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, you're going to hit on those two guys. Like one of those two is going to become the starter. Now, it could be like Minnesota, where Ty Chandler didn't take over until it was too late to really help you. That's going to happen. But we knew Alexander Madison wasn't going to be the guy for you. He wasn't going to be a consistent weekly performer. So we didn't want him on our team. We took Ty Chandler late. And early in drafts, I was taking Ty Chandler and Dwayne McBride. Because I didn't know which guy would emerge. And we knew. And that's how you can use this data to your advantage. Mm -hmm. Because it gives you two advantages. One, you're avoiding the bad player. You're avoiding the guy who's going to disappoint you. So that's number one. But the number two is at a, at a cheap, cheap price. You might be getting a player who can outperform him and take over the starting role. And you want as many starting RB ones on your team as possible, because we saw the usage drops from almost 18 a game to about seven a game. I want more touches every week for my fantasy football team and I'll do better. But very intrigued by this data, Professor. I yep. love seeing that the data is tighter. Uh -huh. Next up is seeing how predictive it is versus total points, because we know we're competing against total points and points per game. And if we can be better than those two, better, then we're going to be better than the consensus. Well, yeah, I, I think there is that. Also, since there's such a wide variation, people are going to pick themselves into losing. In other words, you will benefit by people just making the wrong choice. In other words, it wasn't your, wasn't your choice. It was they made the bad mistakes. Yes. So sometimes their mistakes are your uh, key to victory. So a combination, you're picking better. And they're picking, and who knows what they're picking? You have you can you can benefit both ways, and that's what I think. This approach, the science approach, the MVP. I'm curious about the comms. I will be getting to that counts over median consistency metric that I I, I developed a couple of years ago. I will be getting to that, but. And eventually we might tie it into MVP. I just don't know where that's going yet. I'm doing all this other stuff, folks. I got, I've done my positional analysis. Uh, I've got 239 slides, I think from like 2015 to 23. So I've, I've got a lot to say about, uh, QB, RB, WR, and tight ends, just in general, just at the first la layer of the onion. I'm going to get to the team levels and usages and snaps. And that's coming. But right now, I will tell you the project I'm working on, because I already finished that, I got to start making my lesson plan videos, is I I'm doing the uh, Vegas data, my defense against position metric that Dennis and I use 
and I'm gathering the weekly values uh, data, uh, the points, the attempts, all that. I'm going to try to shoehorn that together. And I don't know how much I'm going to show the public. Dennis and I got to talk about that. <laughs> but I will have that database done. And then I'll move on to the comms and lots. And I like to do snaps and touches. I like to do all that data as well. So I'll be I'll be getting to all this between now and probably July. Because I guess uh, about August, I'm going to start getting serious. I will be doing best ball a little bit, maybe June, July. Just kind of get warmed up. So we will definitely do that. Yeah, and I, I'm i going to roll out my very first best balls over on Underdog. Uh, they got I one got, tournament now already. They, they got tournaments that? going all right now. Yeah, I'm gonna, already. I'm going to start out with a very early one. Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to do is I'm only playing $25 leagues over there. Okay. I'm not jumping in to a lot. You're not going to do the thousand dollar leagues. Come on, no, gonna gonna get very very uh, little over there. That's just gonna be my fun leagues to test a theory, and I'm gonna do like two a month. Yeah, for the early part of the season, I'm gonna date each one. Mm -hmm. That way, for my diary next year, I'll know mm -hmm. how I did as the season, as the drafting season wore on. But I, I kind of already know that I think my process is better than consensus. So I'm going to wait on my money leagues to draft most of those in July and August and let that let the knowledge be my advantage by that point in the draft. Because I think... MVP is going to give me an edge versus consensus once I know more of the facts. Yep. And I'm going to love that indeed. So head on over to the science of fantasy football.com. Check out all that has been written about my MVP yes. index. Check out the professor's efficiency data, folks. I think this is going to have the best potential I at helping us. With, I got to do with, that. Yeah. Weekly matchups is going to be the biggest key on that data in the years ahead. Lots of great lesson plans by the professor as well, already posted from the past and new stuff will be coming. I should have some more articles up there as well. And of course, head on back here next week for another edition of the Science of Fantasy Football. Get to work, folks.